Hey guys, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm really excited to be joined once again by Rick Macy. Rick, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Good to be with you. <laughs> great to have you. So we're going to be talking mainly US Open, and it's the last Grand Slam of the year. Novak Djokovic defending champion, Alcaraz has won the last two Grand Slams, and Sinead just hot off winning Cincinnati. Uh, on the men's side, that is, anyway. And on the women's side, it's a little bit more open, I think. Sabalenka has just won Cincinnati, Sviontek, and you've got a few other players floating around, Rebecca, coaching splits, etc. Um, what's your early kind of thinking, Rick, in terms of how the draw looks and what, what's your, what was your initial reaction after seeing uh, kind of how the seeds fell? Well, you know, for the U.S. Open, I said it a while back, you know, I, I go with Alcarez, you know, I don't really base it on who has a lot of momentum, especially in, in men's tennis, because things change so quickly with the big points. So I'm going with Alcarez uh, on the men's side and Iga on the women's side, um, simply because the court is not as fast as Cincinnati. The score is a little quicker. Favored Sabalinka. I think the general public doesn't realize how the surface subtly, you know, creates all these nuances for the players OK, um, maybe it's a little more complicated because of the grip. They're late a little bit. They make more errors. The other person gets more motivated. You get you then you start overplaying. So those are the intangibles. I think the general public doesn't understand. They just see who won and lost. So I'm going I know I'm not going out on a limb, but I'm taking Alcarez and 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 Iga. Uh, but listen, I think this year it's the U.S., wide open. You know, I think it's a U.S. wide open. I think anybody uh, could win that thing. Uh, three out of five, it becomes more of a mental battle. If we back the truck up, that's why you saw Nadal, Federer, and Djokovic. You could almost mail it in. One of those guys were going to win the slams back in the day, you know, because the mental part plays such a big difference than a 1,000 or just a regular tour event. You know, because of blink of an eye, two out of three sets, it's over on the men's side. So, yeah. um, no, no, but no, you, you Novak, I mean, come on, give me a break. 37 years old, 99 singles titles, you know, 24 grand slams in his pocket. I mean, the guy is incredible. And then Sinner, you know, uh, him and Alcarez on a collision course, maybe in the semis. But I don't look at things like that, you know, the tough draw. Sometimes the tougher draw, believe it or not, makes you better. Because when you, if you win those, it gives you even more of a belief and more confidence. So, um, you know, anybody can beat anybody on the men's side. So those are the three. I know I'm not going out on a limb uh, with that. Then on the women's side, I'm going with, with Iga. I know Coco has been struggling a little bit, but there's a fine line between winning and losing. She almost lost first round of the Open last year. She won 6-3 in the third, and then she ended up winning the whole tournament. So I think it's wide open, uh, but I'm going with Carlos and Iga. Nice. Just for the people who might be watching or listening uh, to this, you mentioned about Sviontek obviously being more potent, having more of an advantage against Sablenko on a slightly slower surface, like the US Open in comparison to Cincinnati, where she lost quite convincingly to Sabalenka. Could you just like quickly explain why that matchup is better for Sviontek, that Sviontek Sabalenka matchup on a slower hard court in comparison to a quicker court? Yeah, well, first off, great question. And, you know, to, to beat Iga, in my opinion, you got to have firepower. You know, you got to take chances. You got to get her uncomfortable to get you comfortable, you know, because let's face it, she has the most brutal angles we've seen in a long time. When she's set, she just yo-yos you around the court. So when the court's a little quicker, grass, that's a different animal, okay? And a faster hard court, because she has a, a Western grip, her contact point deviates a little bit. What I mean is, is she hits it late. Then what happens, the, the serve becomes a little faster on these faster serves. So people get freer points. It's not this, all right, here we go again type of point. So, and they can jolt her. That gives the player more confidence. It makes her think a little bit. She's human. No one's going undefeated. She gets nervous like anybody else. So Cincinnati was a little quicker 
the US Open, the surface is not quite as fast, but that doesn't mean, you know, you still got to play and anybody can beat anybody. So anybody listening, those are the subtle things. Uh, people with a big serve, it does help them if the court's a little quicker or if they hit clean ground strokes, you got to get Ega uncomfortable because when she gets into a rally or she's dealing the cards, she's impossible to beat. And the, everybody knows that because she's proven, you know, she's the one player who you can say she's been consistent mentally the last three, four years. Other than that, it's kind of a jump ball. So, uh, you know, I, I love the way she plays. She reminds me a lot of Nadal on the women's side. And believe it or not, when she was a youngster, she wanted to imitate everything like Rafa, you know, how she moved and how she behaved after she lost the point. You know, and I think more people have to understand what goes on after you lose a point is more important than just actually winning a point. Yeah, agreed. And it's interesting because like Rafa as well, Rafa, you know, back in the day, he also is very susceptible to the big serving, big hitting players, right? Especially, say, like a Wimbledon. Yeah. You know, he might lose now and then in an early round to someone who, who played lights out tennis. And I I think Eager, to be fair to her, is actually not, she's very consistent generally at Grand Slams, but she's susceptible to maybe a sub link or a back and as someone who comes out, can serve really big. And if they if it clicks for for the opponent, they can potentially hit her off the court. But I, I think generally speaking, she's so solid, so it's definitely not a bad pick. I think the U.S. Open courts are they should suit her game, and she's won here before as well, so definitely not, not a bad pick. Um, I guess we can stick with the women because we're talking about it. I mean, what about someone like Jessica Pagula and, and Coco Goff? You mentioned as well on the on the American women. Uh, Pagula is actually potentially going to play she's going to take in a quarter final like what how do you fancy her chances as well she's had some decent form this year and she has a pretty good hard court game i mean is she a potential contender for a, for a title absolutely you know she's rock solid off the ground she's been there done that if she gets to the net she's comfortable you know if she moves good she understands the geometry of the court and once again she's beaten all the top players that's a big thing when you got that big C in your back pocket confidence. So, but once again, she's very solid off the ground and she can control the center of the court. So she's definitely a, a contender, you know, it's just getting through the early rounds and the deeper she goes in the tournament. Um, she can win this. That's why I said it's a little more uh, wide open. And then someone like Coco, she struggled a little bit. We talked about this before. The forehand, when you're confident, you can kind of camouflage it a little bit. You know, she has a big loop. Uh, the grip doesn't bother me. It's just there's a lot of moving parts. She's very wiry and spindly and very athletic. But when she was confident last year, maybe she was taking it earlier, you know, and you can hide it when you're going forward, you know. And so that she's struggling a little bit but she's such a great competitor. She moves as well as anybody out there. Her backhand, you know, uh, is, is incredible. Her slice serve. I really like it. There's something going on with her second. I haven't looked at it too deep, but she's given a lot of free lunches, you know, and now you got a lot to defend. You hopefully, hopefully that's not in her head because she's won these tournaments, you know, Washington, Cincinnati, the open, and she hasn't done that well, you know, and so you hope she's not, thinking like that. And she's just competing because she's a great competitor. So if she gets a little confident, I think she could, she can beat anybody. Then you got to understand Sabalinka, the way she's serving. Okay. And remember she one year hit over 450 double faults. I mean, that's a lot of double faults. And she did it when she was still top five in the world. I mean, you talk about free lunches brought in a biomechanist, they put Humpty Dumpty back together. Her left arm, I saw this on the video, was in the wrong place a lot. The spine angle, there wasn't a counter rotation of the spine. There was a lot of things. But if you do 10 million of anything, it's going to work. But under pressure, you know, it could kind of break down. And then it becomes mental. Then when you throw that into the deal, as you know, that's brutal. So, but she plays to win. She can beat anybody, anytime, anywhere. 
including herself. Okay. Cause if she's a little chippy, it's hard to play lights out and just hit fire like that. But she's definitely one of the contenders and everybody's going to be thinking that cause she just beat Iga. But trust me, the surface comes into play a little bit. Uh, but she did get to the finals last year and won the first set off of Coco. Uh, but she has the game because what I like about her game off both sides, she's elite. She's an elite ball striker off both sides and her serve. So she's dealing the cards in all these matches. So it's mostly played under her terms. And the only way it's not is if she gets a little chippy or upset, which she can, and she checks out at Publix, she could check out. Or someone else has the firepower to go toe-to-toe -to -toe a few shots with her. So it, it depends on the draw, but she would be one of them. Um, there's a lot of Americans. There's five Americans, uh, the men and the women, the more in the top 20 in the last 20 years. This is amazing. I mean, they're not near the top, but there's a cluster of them. You got Goff. You got Pagula, okay. Um, you got Collins, you got Keys, okay. You got all these girls in there, uh, and they're all capable, you know, they're all capable. And you know, as well as I do, if someone gets upset, you know, if Iga gets knocked out, a lot, a lot of people feel good about that. Or if Alcarez center or Joker, Joker exit states left, people start thinking, why not me? You know, and that's what they used to think about Nadal, Federer, and Djokovic, but they never lost in these tournaments, it seemed like, you know? So it's it's definitely wide open more than ever. And if I can now go to the guys a little bit, there's five guys in the top 20, the Americans, okay? Even though they're not near the top, okay? You got uh, Taylor Fritz, okay? You got uh, Sebastian Corda, you got Tommy Paul, you got Ben Shelton, okay? You got Francis Tiafo, you got all these guys um, in there that are capable, you know, if someone gets upset or there's an injury or whatever, it's, it's wide open. So I could see an American get to the semis or the finals and who knows, maybe one of them could win it since uh, one of my former students, Andy Roddick. Nice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's interesting, especially on the men's side, there's, there's, I think, as you said, there's five, male players in the top 20 for the first time since the 90s and they did they did a comparison i mean it's, it's a bit different because they had a sampras and courier and you know it's a little bit different in terms yeah, of i didn't say their exact ranking i didn't say you know where their rank i mean top was like 20 then you got like 12 13 14 yeah you're right it's a different but still uh it's better uh than what it ever has been there's some good depth okay um and there's some good young players uh, that are coming up. So uh, I like what I see with uh, American tennis for the men and the women. Yeah, no, agreed. And I think it's for the women. I mean, they've also got some players like Anissa Mova, for example. Um, and we'll talk about Sophia Kennan, who obviously you've worked really closely with as well, um, who, who could potentially do something. Um, I wanted to quickly ask you actually on Sabalenka. Uh, she didn't play the Olympics, right? So she skipped it. Now, Goff and Sviantec and Pogula, they've all played at the Olympics, so they had to go from clay to grass to clay to now hardcore. How much of an advantage is it for Sabalenka to miss the Olympics and have a bit of hardcore time before the US Open? Is it quite a substantial advantage, do you think? Or it doesn't matter too much? I mean, Sviantec's her draw, for example, Sviantec's draw is not particularly hard, so could she then feel herself into the draw? And it, and it will then level out, do you think? Like, how, how do you view it as a coach? Well, I think it's all individual. You know, it's a choice. You know what you're signing up for. You know what you're getting into. You know you're going to be traveling and the surfaces and stuff like that. At the end of the day, it does build character. But some people feel more comfortable with more preparation on the surface. So it's not one size fits all. This isn't cookie cutter or cloning. So uh, it obviously worked out for Sabalinka, you know. But also, like I said, the court was very quick and that was to her advantage. But I think to play in the Olympics, you know, a lot of players, if they get picked, uh, who knows what tomorrow brings? And it could be a once in a lifetime opportunity. And just the overall experience, uh, it's actually bigger than the game of tennis. You know, that's something, especially if they get a medal, that's something for your whole life, you know, where we look at it or people in the media look at it. 
like why wouldn't they play or whatever, or why would they play? It's, it's a great, great honor. But the preparation to be on a surface for a longer period of time, it has to be, uh, you know, the leader in the clubhouse because you're going to get more confident. You know, you're just going to be more confident with the bounce of the ball, the movement, and it doesn't become such a mental thing. You know, when you start jumping from this to that, that's why you got to have your hats off to Rafa, you know, win, winning on clay, then he goes and wins Wimbledon. That's a quick turnaround. That has You never saw Federer do that. You know what I'm saying? And now you see Alcaraz do that. That's crazy when you go from the slowest to the fastest. Because playing on grass, that's like a whole different surface. Right? That's like a whole different sport. You know, you change your whole mindset, your tactics and stuff like that. The mental part, everything changes. But uh, I think Sabalinka made the, the right decision, and she's obviously beaming with confidence. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting one. And I guess it's right that it isn't one size fits all. And interesting to see now, Shriontek, you know, does she just gather steam in the first few rounds? And obviously, she will be a little bit disappointed with the fact that she was a favorite for the gold medal at the Olympics, given it was on clay at Roland Garros, and she didn't manage to secure the gold. But it most likely will light a fire under her to then kind of kick on right at the US Open. So, uh, it could go one or two ways. <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll see how she handles it mentally. But generally speaking, her mentality is, is very strong. So, so I strong. Expect some sort of deep run from her. No, no. She's listen. E, that's why Iga is where she's at, and everybody else uh, is a contender. But the favorite when she plays any tournament except Wimbledon is Iga, because mentally she's proven time and time again. You know what I'm saying? And that cuts both ways, not only to herself with a belief like no other, but to the other players. You know, it's not over until you shake hands with her. And she's proven that, you know, and that that's huge when you get out there and you're battling on that court. Yeah, 100 percent. And yeah, I mean, I mean, lastly, on, on the women's side, I wanted to ask you about a few of the, the popcorn first round matches, Rick. And, and one of them is uh, one of your former protégés, I guess we can say, and Sophia Kennan. She is a former Grand Slam champion. She plays a fellow former Grand Slam champion, Emma Raducanu. I mean, how how exciting, first of all, is that matchup? And, and how do you see it playing out? And what does Sophia need to do to, to get the win? Um. Well, it's interesting because that is a very tough first round matchup, but it all depends to me on Sophia's health and her movement. Listen, she understands the geometry of the court as well as anybody on the tour. You know, that wasn't a fluke when she won the Australian Open. She's dealt with a lot of things, injuries, personal stuff, but she... <laughs> She can beat anybody. I mean, she beat Sabalinka last year. She can. She beat Goff last year. So she's a giant killer. People have to understand. Uh, Sophia Kennan can play. To me, it's all about her movement and her health. Because if you're a few milliseconds late to the ball, okay, it might not affect you on the first one or second or third, but in the fourth one, you're playing more defense and set on your front foot. So to me, it's all about uh, the movement. And there's no doubt in my mind, if Kennan, if Sophia is aggressive and confident, she can win. Now, all that being said, and I think I talked to you about this, and I said it before she made her comeback, uh, Emma can definitely be top 10 again. You know, I said the same thing about Sabalinka. I mean, not Sabalinka, about Osaka. I said the same thing about her uh, and both of them by the end of, 2025 okay they both have that because you don't lose that pedigree so that's a blockbuster first round match and uh, to me it really comes down to uh the mental part who handles those moments the best because they kind of play similar they hit the ball clean they're crafty they're both good competitors i think you got to give a little edge to emma because she's been on more of a roll but i've seen sophia kennan not be doing anything and then just drop three great players in a row. So never count out Sonic Boom. That's what I used to call her back in the day when I had her from age seven to 12. And she's the scariest little creature. And I've done this a long time. I ever taught the scariest little creature 
until I have this eight-year-old from Ukraine, Vlada uh, Haranchar, who's winning all the little mows. In my opinion, barring injury, can't miss. And uh, I think uh, with me and developing a player, uh, I think I have number one on the horizon. But she's only eight years old, but she's amazing. Amazing. Amazing to hear. And, yeah, I mean, talking of Asaka, you mentioned Asaka and the fact that she, you know, you have faith that she'll probably break into the top 10 at the end of 2025, end of next year. She also has a really tough first round op opponent. So, obviously, being a four-time Grand Slam champion herself, but she's unseeded and she plays the number 10 seed, who is the former Roland Garros champion, and Yelena Ostapenko, who's very hard-hitting as well. I mean, there's going to be a lot of winners, not a lot of running, I imagine, in that match. Right. Um, Rick, how do you see it playing out? Um, when, who's playing who now? Who's that? Osaka is playing Ostapenko. Yeah, listen, uh, fasten your seatbelt because the point's going to be quick. And both their mentality, if you hit hard and miss, hit harder. I think that's their mentality. You know, I mean, let's face it, Osaka hit 60 winners okay, against Iga on clay. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it'll be interesting because both of them, in my opinion, uh, when you're when they're getting dictated to, they're not quite as good, especially Ostapenko. So I'm going with Osaka because she plays a little better defense, okay, a little better defense. But to me, that could be, that could be a toss-up. Um, it's unfortunate they play in the first round because both of them are giant killers and could beat beat anybody. Osaka, she's been there, done that. You know, the U.S. Open's a, a good friend of hers. So, you know, whoever gets through that match is definitely going to have a lot of confidence, that's for sure. Yeah, 100%. I mean, that is one of my picks, not just even on the women's side, but potentially on the men's as well. And uh, just lastly on on the women, um, another matchup that I wanted to talk to you about was Jasmine Paolini and Bianca Andreescu. And Jasmine Paolini, of course, has made back-to-back -back Grand Slam finals, the last two slams. And Andreescu's a former US Open champion, hasn't been in great form. I mean, is it a potentially good matchup with Paolini? Just do you think at the moment, form-wise and talent-wise, just a bit too strong in this one? Absolutely. You know, and I think anybody that's watching, it's not where you start. It's where you finish, you know, everybody's wondering where this Italian flamethrower or this Italian firecracker came from, you know, she's kind of trending. What is she like four in the world now? People are yeah. going, what, you know, so, and you don't have to be big to be great. It's how big you are here in the heart, you know, and uh, I like her fight. I like her grit. Okay. Um, now it's going to be a little bit of different pressure. She's supposed to win, even though it happened the last tournament. So it's going to be a little bit different pressure. I cannot figure out and rescue because uh, I've seen her play before back in the day. And I saw when she beat Serena, I was very impressed with her game. You know, she had a great drop shot from outer space. You know, she could really like flip the script like Ash Barty. Uh, she chipped the ball, but I really don't know that much about her and why she hasn't come back into the top 10. I always look at these things very differently. You don't lose the talent. You know, you don't lose the proven. So, but we're not privy to all this other stuff that's going on. So, and as you play more, you should be getting better because you're getting in more repetitions and you're getting more experience. So it's almost like who needs experience? You know, when we go to Rana Kanyu, okay, or uh, whoever's done well back in the day, you know, we it's like you should be getting better. And that shows you how the mental part, you know, even Fernandez, you know, Leila Fernandez, because they have the game, they have the talent. So it shows you how much the mental. So when people get there and they stay there, that's how I start defining greatness, like Iga. And the guys that we talked about uh, earlier, you know, it's one thing to get there and nibble on the edges or make a cameo, you know, then exit stage left. That's easy. Well, not easy, but to greatness, I always define with consistency, you know, to get there and stay there because you're dealing with different pressures, 
different environment or your whole world around you changes, but it's still a ball, a net and a racket. And you're out there to play anybody, anytime, anywhere. Yeah, no, agreed. Agreed. And uh, I think we can move on to the men's actually. Uh, I wanted to, to dive into that a bit with you. Uh, before we do get into the draw, though, I, I've got to ask you uh, a couple, about a couple of things. I guess, first of all, I'm assuming you caught the Olympic final between Djokovic and Alcaraz. Um, first of all, what did you think of it? And second of all, were you surprised, I guess, by the outcome, um, given how Djokovic has maybe looked this year? Um, no, nothing Nothing surprises me uh uh, especially with the Serbian sniper, nothing, you know what I'm saying? Nothing surprises me. Um, now, obviously the favorite people are thinking Carlos, and then they go back the truck up and, you know, he took him out in three straight sets at Wimbledon, but people got to understand, you know, playing on your front yard is much different than playing in a sand pit. So the slower surface uh, gives Joker a little bit more time but all that being said, Carlos is still the favorite. And remember, two out of three is very different than three out of five. The way you look at it, the way you feel pressure, the way you play points and stuff like that. You would see if that's, that had been three out of five, both players think and play it differently. I know that. I know you understand that, but a lot of people don't understand probably what I just said, you know, because they know it's a little bit more of a journey, but you got to give, uh, you know, the Serbian sniper, all the credit. He's the goat. I mean, I, he probably never wanted something so bad in his life. What with that guy, what's ever in front of him at that moment, at that minute, at that second, that's the most important thing in his life. And he gave it his all and, you know, just a great match, a, a classic, but no, it didn't surprise me. Um, uh, whatsoever and if carlos uh who you know i'm high on if he doesn't win it uh the person i would like to see is novak because what he's doing at 37 years old and now you know <laughs> put a gold ball in there I, the people they don't appreciate greatness the numbers with this guy are eye-popping you know 99 singles titles you know, we talked about all the grand slams. I mean, brutal. You, and this is 37. Okay, this has never been done ever before. You know, and it's a testament to how he's wired mentally and the physical fitness part that he puts in. All we do is turn on the TV and you see this guy like the rubber band man, you know, and you don't understand the commitment and the motivation to want to get up and do it especially when one kid's in one arm and one kid's on the other and daddy, let's go this and daddy do that. You, you got to have a lot of respect for this guy. So uh, no, it didn't surprise me uh, uh, whatsoever. And uh, I think it just puts a cherry or takes it even further that he is the goat. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. It just, it's, it just come well reaffirms. I think the fact that he is the, the greatest ever to, to grace the tennis court and, it was almost like sheer willpower, wasn't it? I mean, how Kras didn't play a bad match at all. There were no breaks of serve. I think there were 14 break points in total. And then there was a really important game at 4 all in the first set. And Al Kras, I think, had four break points. And Djokovic managed to hold. And as soon as he held, actually, I said uh, to some people who, who I was watching with that he'll win the set. I said he's going to win the set now. Because I just feel like sometimes those really long games whether you're serving or returning, whoever tends to come out on top in that specific game when it's when it's even Stevens and it's really competitive, they tend to take the momentum through. And I felt like he did in the end, obviously, won the tiebreaker. And the second set, uh, obviously, another tiebreaker. But he went into lockdown mode. And uh, some people would like to call him tiebreakovic. <laughs> and yeah, I think he, he channeled that uh, for sure. But, I mean... Yeah, it was it was an incredible performance in honesty. And I think, you know, you talked about the pacing and the pacing of a best of three compared to best of five is yeah, very different. And that's very why different. you see more upsets, right, in a best of three compared to a best of five. And that's why when you had the big three, you know, in slams, they were a lot 
better and they, they in terms of if you I, i'm sure if we look to their win percentage and in terms of matches won and lost they had a better record in slams compared to some of the best of three tournaments where they were more susceptible to losing because you know they couldn't come back from two sets of love down uh, and we know how many times someone like Novak Djokovic in his prime did that um, and even someone like a Federer and Nadal so yeah I mean an in incredible effort from him and uh, I mean for Carlos right how does he recover mentally from that Rick because mentally you know he was kind of crying a little bit after he's your pick obviously to win the tournament so yeah. you backing him to kind of recover mentally reset and just go again and then if he were to win, of course, it'd be three Grand Slam times in a row. So not a bad year for him. <laughs> well, first off, last year, okay, we might have talked about this earlier. Last year, after the U.S. Open, I, I did an interview and I said, in 2024, I'm picking Alcarez to win three slams. I mean, it's, yes, it's everywhere. Me. And that's after he struggled, you know, after he lost U.S. Open, he didn't do a lot. Then people start you know, get a different coach, get a different disc, you know, change racket, change socks. You know, people start like getting into all this crazy stuff. And if it doesn't kill you, it's going to make you stronger. And he's such a young guy. See, the eyeball test for me doesn't lie. Uh, talent, he has the talent. He has the ability. He has the mind. He has the movement. He's a generational talent. That's why I go there. He's not going to beat everybody. He's, he's going to lose. I mean, that's part of the, especially in men's tennis, it's so close. So that's why it made him better. It made him stronger by losing. So I flipped the script the other way, where most people, if someone's winning a lot, I'm picking that guy. And confidence does breed confidence, but sometimes losing, those little nuggets along the way, they will make you stronger. And you recall those, and it builds character and fortitude. I'm just telling you, and losing the way he did uh, with the gold medal, believe me, the next time he plays, whether he wins it or not, it's irrelevant. It will help him. It will help him. It motivates you. You try harder. You dig deeper. You you look at it through a different lens. You know, losing motivates people. So, yeah, then he comes back, and he's on a hard court. He played not very good. because I saw some of the match against Monfils. Uh, you know, and then people can draw a lot from him breaking the racket. And I'm saying to myself, I think that's good, even though it's out of character. It shows you what a perfectionist, how much passion he has. You know, he expects so much more out of himself and that will make him work harder. Not that they already don't work hard. He'll work even harder uh, to get ready for the U.S. Open, you know. So it's so these people throw this stuff in the garbage can especially the guys so quickly. I mean, this is flushed and it's gone. They don't even think it like it didn't even happen. It's like someone double faulting on the men's tour. They don't even think about it. Or maybe someone a little more fragile, you know, maybe on the women's side might think, what's the matter with my serve? And they deaccelerate. Where the guys act, it doesn't even happen. That's mind control. Alcarez isn't thinking about the gold medal or, his last, they don't think of it like that whatsoever. You know, they don't, and people had doubts about him before Indian Wells, Alcarez, and then he wins it. He's back. You know, we don't know what's in his head, but I got a good idea. And barring injury, uh, he's going to go down as one of the greatest players ever to hold a racket. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Is that the difference then, Rick, I guess, in terms of mentality between the greatest players and the rest of them? on tour in terms of learning from your mistakes and actually being motivated by those losses and using those to be a catalyst to improve and win even further. No, no question about it, you know, and you, you could imagine the unwavering in-depth belief of a Nadal or a Djokovic or a Federer. You do, you know, everybody has confidence. You have confidence. I have confidence. My daughter next to me. I think my cat has confidence, okay? Everybody has confidence. There's a different level. There's a different level. And, you know, they they know how to manage this stuff. And they don't make a mountain out of a molehill. You know, they'll use good things to motivate them, but they don't let that negativity bring them, you know? And this happens a little too much on the WTA tour. You know, there's just a lot more emotion 
you know, and that's why it's really important to have the right team and have your head on straight and you got to have unreal discipline and not get too high and too low because nothing really changes. You're going to the next tournament and bang, you're there and you're doing this for one reason. You love to compete and to be the best competitor you are, you have to have your, your head on straight. And so, no, he'll use all this to motivate himself, um, not just for the U S open for his whole career, all these yesterdays or all these failures. This is what people don't understand. Um, Djokovic didn't start winning all these grand slams. So, a little later in his career. You know what I'm saying? This is like so important uh, that people understand all these failures and things that happen to you. It builds character. Um, and so I look at it as a, as a positive uh, as their career goes forward. Yeah, well said. And talking of, I guess, some of the great players at the moment on tour, Yannick Sinner is, of course, one of them, the world number one. Uh, what were your thoughts on his recent, I guess, testing positive for a couple of banned substances a few months ago? Uh, and it seems like he, I think he's provisionally banned or suspended for a week. Um, but I think that was in between tournaments. And then he's been fined, of course, and money, uh, but no, no ban or anything. And it was a very small amount. I think it was a billionth of <laughs> what was that, the measurement. But of course, there's been varying views i guess from people in a similar positions to yourself current players um and just general fans as well some people thinking yeah fine we're happy with what you know, the ita have done others not so happy um and in fact i guess the third category is people just maybe not blaming sin or anyone else but more being a bit frustrated with the fact that there, that there is inconsistency with a lot of the cases that have been happening the last few years. I mean, what's your take on it as a coach as well? And uh, and what do you think, I guess, of the actual situation and generally how the ITA handled these these cases? Well, first off, um, you know, it, the players that criticize, let me go to that first. I understand where they're coming from because the top players, they're always going to feel they're treated different. They get better scheduling. You know what I mean? They get treated, they're listened to a lot more. Uh, they get uh, appearance money, you know, for a lot of the tournaments, but they do draw the biggest crowds and there's TV. So they are going to always think that they're getting better treatment. Okay. Because they are. But now when you have a problem like this, now they get into, well, that's because of who it is, you know, but if I could back the truck up, you know, someone say, if that happened to say Kyrgios, the same exact situation. Okay. I don't think uh, Nick would say, uh, I think he would come up, whether it's a legitimate excuse, it's real or whatever. Listen, you and I don't know. Okay. But the story that they put out there, anybody would do the same thing. It's accidental. I didn't know, you know, they're talking, came from the physio. It was a spray. It's an anabolic steroid from Italy. You know, I got it during a massage. You know, you, you, you put it all together and people think, yeah, that's, yeah, right. But you got to come up with some explanation. And, but if it was you, it happened to every one of the players that are complaining, they would say the same thing if it happened to them. Now, what they're probably more upset about is not that, but how he got a provisional suspension. I think that's what it was. But he appealed it. So that's why he could keep playing, even though he lost points. Okay. And he lost prize money, which is kind of relevant. Okay. And it went in front of the people and they made a decision that it was accidental, so on and so forth. We'll never know. That's a story. So everybody's going to chime in their opinion, which they're entitled to. But if it happened to them, any of the players that are complaining, whether it was on purpose or not, they were trying to get like uh, an athletic edge. They would come up with some excuse also. You know, we're really not going to know. Um, and that's what makes the world go around. Everybody has an opinion. Yeah, yeah. So, Rick, I mean, what's your? there's obviously been quite a few different examples and instances in the last few years. I mean, we had, of course, like the Elias Imer one. 
um, or Mikel Ima one, sorry, even. Um, we also had like Tara Moore as well from the UK. There's been there's been a few different instances in the last couple of years. I mean, I don't, I don't know how much you've looked into it, but I mean, what's your view on how the ITA are kind of handling it? Do you think there's been consistency, I guess, across it is more my question. That's the problem. You know, I think anybody just wants consistency because you got Jensen Brooksby, you know, and the people that you just mentioned, you can throw in Halep. I mean, this is go on and on. But then again, uh, something did happen to Sharapova back in the day and something happened to Hennon back in the day. Oh, it's, it's not like it hadn't happened to top players. I think, you know, if he, we can't sit here and say, well, if he was a hundred in the world it would have been different. We don't know. You know what I'm saying? Just because it's center. Okay. I think that's why it's going to look at like, let's get some consistency, but they do need to, in my opinion, let it play out a little longer because some people that got suspended, uh, they didn't go at it the way he did and appeal it right away. I think that was their fault. And someone got suspended for like what, two years or a year and a half. So they need yeah, to clean yeah. it up. Yeah. They need to it's clean it up. Cause she didn't have the, the legal, um, she didn't have the money to basically. Correct. Pay to pay You're right. Back. And that's kind of the way it is in the legal system, especially here in the United States, you know, sometimes, you know, the best lawyers uh, that you can afford, you know, kind of can help you. So, but they do need to get boom, 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 and everybody play by the same rules. And so I think once again, from this situation, from this negative situation, I think a lot of positive is going to come out of it. Let's hope so. Because yeah, yeah. No, listen, no, it's, it's whether it's an accident or on purpose, there needs to be the exact same protocols of how this is done. And it shouldn't rely on oh, that one has more money so they can play the game different. And it shouldn't be like that. It should be the same for everybody if you're on the pro tour. 100%, yeah, fair, yeah. a fair trial, right, is what you'd say in the legal system, a fair trial for everyone. And yeah, and, and the same protocol followed, which is, yeah, we can ask for. And as you say, it's difficult to know exactly whether it was deliberate or not. I mean, I, I tend to err on the side of, assuming that it was done in error and it was just innocence was involved um, because I, I like to be that type of person but yeah I can sure. see why people will be cynical and, and think that you know he's trying to gain an advantage and and you know I, I get that as well I, I everyone's entitled to their opinion but I guess the good thing is that they they had the they did look into it was investigated they've decided the IT that he's he's not you know he's not guilty of anything uh, and it was just yeah a mistake uh, and not his mistake as well so that's positive and he goes on i mean how much do you think rick does that does that affect him if at all going into the us open he won the australian open earlier this year he clearly enjoys playing on hard court he's also had a slight hip injury uh, which has been a little bit iffy i don't know if you've seen him recently but i, I don't know whether he's 100 percent in terms of his health as well um, how do you see it all playing out uh, with the mental aspect of the trial, the hip and, and his form as well going into the US Open? Well, first off, great question. Because I think people, everybody, listen, no one's bulletproof, you know, and, you know, we hear, you know, a lot of stuff. Sometimes you don't want to listen. Okay. But everybody's human. So, and he, you know, I don't know him personally, but he seems like a great kid, very professional from what I heard from his coaches and people around, just a great, great human being. Um, so that means he probably has a lot of humility and he has a lot of gratitude. So he could be a little more sensitive, you know, what people think or perceive because uh, that will always be with him his whole career, you know, especially as he's more successful and people start saying negative things. So it could have an impact, um, you know, cause your mind needs to be locked and loaded and ready to launch. You know, your mind has to be, cause you know, as well as I do, you know, in the blink of an eye, you can lose a set. If you're just not there, you gotta be there. One of the best assets of, of the Italian flamethrower is he seems mentally locked in there uh, all the time. You know, he doesn't have a lot of dips. So yeah, I think it could affect him a little bit, I think the good thing is it's three out of five. But then again, uh, you you said something 
that I saw, even though he won Cincinnati, there was a few Houdini escapes. There was a few matches he played dodgeball and he could have lost. Fine line between winning and losing. I think he won because uh, he's sinner. But his movement, you know, I saw him a few milliseconds late in and out of the corners like I didn't see when I've seen some of his matches with Carlos or other people. I mean, he was a jackrabbit on steroids, and he just looked, no pun intended, because we're talking doping here, no <laughs> jackrabbit on steroids. He, he gets in and out of the corners, he just didn't look as nimble. and But no one could probably see that, you know. And like you said, he had a hit little thing with the hip. And, you know, he's a gangly guy. And he stretches a lot like the Joker out wide. You know, uh, he gets he gets a, uh, in and out of the corners like a champion skier he was at age 11. So I saw a little different in the movement. And if the movement's a little different, whether it be from nerves, not that I'm saying it's that, whether it be from nerves or whatever, once the movement goes, it changes your balance, it changes your options, you know, are you on the front foot or the back foot? Are you playing with more spin, taking more chances? The movement is key for, you know, the same with for Joker, you know? So that's what I saw. To me, he didn't look 100%, and here I am saying that, and he won Cincinnati. Because I just feel he's better than the rest of the field, except maybe Alcarez and on a given day, you know, Joker. I just think he's better. Okay. It's like we talked about Coco. I think she's better in all these other areas, but the forehand brings her back down where she could be vulnerable. So, yeah, I hope it doesn't affect him. But unfortunately, that this has come out and it's the U.S. Open and, you know, you ask me the question, it's going to be asked when I do all the other TV stuff, and it's going to be a major issue every time he wins a match or if he loses, they'll write about the story, but the steroids are going to be part of the story, unfortunately, for this for this Grand Slam. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and I, <laughs> I'll probably be quite nice, and I only mention it in this video to be honest i actually haven't done any content on it at all because it's a weird one i i did have some knowledge of what had happened and obviously some other cases but i didn't feel like i was as fully informed um to kind of really give uh, an educated opinion on it and i also didn't want to be too judgmental because it's difficult as you say it's, it's hard to know unless you're actually in the camp like what's exactly happened as it happened who knows whether it's intentional or not um so all you can say is that he's yeah he's been cleared to play and you know hopefully it won't happen again <laughs> but, but it <laughs> is an interesting it is an interesting uh scenario where the guy gets a cut on his hand the one guy gives it to the physio you know and it's on his hand and sinner gets it through a mas massage and it shows up when he does the urine sample you know, because people are now getting an in-depth uh, knowledge of how these things happen. And it's almost like abracadabra, give me a break. That's what people are going to be thinking. But that's how these things happen. You know, you could, it could be in a food, it could be in meat. There's all kinds of ways uh, these things can happen. And like you said, he's been cleared. So uh, it's showtime in, in New York. Yeah, 100% showtime in New York. Exactly. And Look, I mean, I'm hoping we get that Sinal Crash semi final, which is projected to happen. And yeah, that, that'll, be a, that'll be a blockbuster if we do get it. But he has a potential tricky opponent, actually, in Tommy Paul in round four, uh, which could be very physical. And that'll really test his hip, I think, as well, um, to see whether he's really uh, fully fit or not, or fit enough anyway uh, to compete. On some of the other players who are maybe not in the favorites, because, you know, we know we've, we're talking about Alcaraz, Djokovic, and also thinner as well there's kind of a rung below you'd say maybe um, there's a few players that will be creeping looking to kind of push in and potentially do something and, and two of those players are Holger Rune and Stefano Tsitsipas um, both of them of course have also had recent splits from coaches Holger Rune with Patrick Morotoglu I think for the second time in 
only a couple of years and sits past with well his dad <laughs> which is uh, always an interesting one um, but obviously just as a coach um, it looks like they might have already picked up potential coaches but I wanted to get your thoughts on in terms of uh, well I guess as a coach yourself like how do you see their style of play and then also what type of coach do you think would be most beneficial to get the most out of their game first off great question you know coaching at the pro level is very different okay and I, the, what i mean by that it's not as much technical or it's not as much biomechanical okay it's more strategic support motivation and you're like a manager you know that's what people have to understand and i'm not saying they don't offer technical help but it's not as much that okay and it's all about getting them ready mentally and taking care of everything for them and the personalities have to click and so a lot of times you become almost one of their best friends instead of the coach and that's what they want but then when things don't go well a lot of these people will change coaches like they change socks like you said <laughs> rude you know so it's all the personality uh, of the person, you know, and like Kyrgios, you know, no matter what anybody would try to do, the best coach for Nick Kyrgios is the guy in the mirror. Cause that's the only guy he's going to listen to, you know? So maybe some people when they're younger, they need someone that instills more discipline and to be more professional. And, you know, this is how you got to be. And, you know, uh, but you got to buy into that. But then when you start losing, they don't want someone that strict, you know, and some people on the tour, maybe on the women's tour, they want more of a travel buddy, you know, it, it's a very complicated uh, scenario. But that being said, eventually, if things are not going well, for a long period of time, you got to figure out why they're not going well. But maybe a new voice, uh, and you, tr you try a new voice, the way someone says it, how they say it, say it, why to say it, when to say it. You know, there's an art to this of communicating with a player. You know, how I talk to the pros that I work with are much different than an eight-year-old or the number one 12-year-old girl in Europe. So it's a very different communication that you got to do. And there's an art to this whole thing. But my opinion, more people should add biomechanists to their team if the player wants to reprogram some muscle memory or reprogram the reflexes, because there's just a lot of flaws out there. The problem is they can't take the time off during the tour. Will the player want to put in the work like Sabalinka did on her serve, where she went from, she didn't have a, a fault, double faults in the finals of Grand Slam at the Australian. Give me a break. That's amazing. Okay. So the team had enough knowledge that, listen, we know what we don't know. We need to get someone in there. So I think it's better not to keep changing coaches all the time, but to add maybe people that have more expertise, whether it's in motivation or looking at the game differently, because people can get stale even with tactics. You know what I'm saying? And it happens in every sport, whether it be tennis, football, baseball, basketball, sometimes a different voice and a different set of eyes can change the whole landscape because at the end of the day, it's, it's about the player. It's always about the player. Uh, it's not about the coach always. Yeah, no, agreed. And I guess from your point of view then, because I asked you about these two players uh, as a coach, when you look at say, let's take six pass, for example, look at who, when you see his game in terms of strengths and weaknesses and things. Who, like whose that. game? In sits pass? Okay. Yeah, no, I look at his game. Um, he's a talented player. Um, there's limitations. You know, there's new people coming into the mix. Okay. And I just think that his one hand of back end is good, but it's not as good as a lot of the two-handers that are out there. I think mentally he has to get stronger. Uh, obviously, he could beat anybody, anytime, anywhere, 
and he had could have his moments and he could pull some upsets. But because I feel there's some, I don't want to say holes in his game. I don't think he's like the the best volleyer. Um, you know, I just think there's, and then mentally, sometimes he doesn't stay locked in there all the time. When that happens, you're vulnerable to be upset more than other people that maybe are in the top five if he's in that next echelon or next echelon. So to sit here and say exactly what he should do, you got to be careful of that, you know, because you can't go from night to day. Oh, you got to be more aggressive and you got to start cutting the cord and hit the ball early and you got to come to the net a lot more. He came to the net a lot more against Alcarez and he still got carved up like a Thanksgiving turkey, even though he came in to the net, you know, a lot more, but he needed to do that. You know, you got to keep adding more to your game because you're not adding, you're subtracting because the people behind you are coming up. And this is the thing. So I don't, I don't know him. I don't really know his game, but mentally he's going to have to really become stronger. He's a little better in my opinion on clay because he has more time, you know, he can still play on hard. Uh, obviously not that well on grass. So um, it will be interesting to see what happens. And because he maybe hasn't done as well uh, and he parted ways with his dad, I'm not saying that's good or bad. Time will tell. But all these people have to understand, the player plays. If we back the truck up, there was a time when Feder was number one. He didn't have a coach. You know, you got to understand this stuff. And, you know, we're back in the day. I, I think everybody needs a helping hand, but it's who's given the helping hand. You just don't want a friend to sit in your box. You know, regarding my situation, I'd rather build the box than sit in the box, but I would sit in the box if I built the box. So that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> no, I get that. That makes sense. I think we talked about this before um, that you said, yeah, you, you wouldn't, that there's a reason why maybe <laughs> you're not on tour at the moment because uh, you like the setup, how it is right now. No, I mean, that, that was really interesting, Rick. Appreciate it. Is there anything from your side that you want to touch upon before we wrap up? No, you know, I just think that uh, people have to understand the game in general is so much faster and quicker. And obviously the technology, and this is what people have to understand, even young coaches. And in my opinion, stroke mechanics is at an all time high. You know, you, know, you see the, the way the men hit the forehand, generally speaking, is very different than the women. OK, the two and the back is a little different because it's more trunk rotation. So you can make more of a bubble loop or a bigger swing, a bigger swing. So movement is at an all time high and stroke mechanics. So when you evaluate talent or you build a player, uh, obviously the genetics have to be there because people don't understand if you're a donkey, like I can make the donkey move a lot better, but it's still a donkey. OK, or turtle. I can make the turtle better, but it's still a turtle. If you have a thoroughbred, OK, you're going to be able to hang in there on a rainy day or when you're nervous. So genetics play a lot to do with this. And that's what I need all the coaches to understand. But then again, the cards you're dealt at a young age, OK, from people that really understand technique. And I'm not saying there's a wrong way or right way, but there could be a better way, you know. And the best thing to do is look at some of the best strokes on the ATP tour, have your students watch those strokes, try to be in the neighborhood. You got to be in the neighborhood, not the zip code. You got to be in the neighborhood and try to imitate that if you can. The problem is everybody wants help, especially more junior girls, but they don't want to change. They stand in the same place on the serve. They take the racket back the same way. People are just saying, use your legs, toss it higher. You know, it's very vanilla and then you see people on the pro tour and you're going, you know, they had millions of dollars of lessons from age five to 18 and they still can't serve right. Or it's not their calling card, but they're there because of other attributes. So my message to all the young coaches out there, you know, get as much knowledge as you can in biomechanics. Uh, don't be afraid to ask other people for help because at the end of the day, it's about the player not the coach. 
yeah no i i totally get that and yeah i mean it, the player coach relationship is uh it can be a complicated one very um, with, with all these splits etc but yeah I, i'm interested to see how it's passed and also holger Rune as well he's obviously very young and had a very impressive you know first year or two on tour and hasn't quite been able to kind of match those heights and and kind of push on and so i'm intrigued to see how he gets on as well rick i really appreciate you being on as always um thank you for uh, your time and uh yeah i mean guys if you haven't already of course go and check out rick he's not only in in florida at his academy but he also has a youtube channel that you can check out some really good instructional videos uh, some biomechanical bits on there as well which i love watching and um, lots of good content on there and if you are new to this channel then please do subscribe to Quality Shot Tennis also follow us on podcast platforms as well if you're listening on an audio platform um, guys have a good one enjoy the rest of the US Open thank you Rick, for being on no we'll do it again I love talking with you because I love talking tennis and helping others thanks Rick